All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick and Mr. Brad Thomas. He joins us today. We're going to talk all college football. We're going to be guided by your shining light here, Brad. We're going to talk week zero games and then we're going to talk some outright markets for the Big Ten and SEC champion, uh, which I do actually have some bets on, though. It is not my mail at all, but I will pass it on. Uh, but what's news, Brad? How you been, man? Listen, I've been so good. It felt like the offseason was at a slow crawling pace, especially as a Bama guy. We had the Nick Saban news and all I wanted was football to start so we could stop talking about is the dynasty over who's going to leave the program, who's coming into the program. <laughs> now we're here. Football starts for Alabama. It's in two weeks. But for all of us betters, it starts this week with week zero. I'm stoked, like super stoked. I could not agree with you more. Uh, and uh, it feels like the tradition of week zero will continue where you have some massive market moves and some huge middles that uh, look likely to hit in some of these games. And I want to start with the uh, uh, Florida State uh, Georgia Tech game. So uh, just for, you know, just for full kind of um, market update for anyone who hasn't been following along, this opened up at Florida State minus 13 and a half. Uh, there was a steady stream of Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets support that pushed this all the way down to 10, at which point the folks who I'm sure had the early 13 and a half, so were happy to take the minus 10s to create that nice little middle for themselves. Um, what do you, ex can you help me understand a little bit what's going on with um, the, uh, the market dynamics in this one? And uh, just in general, if you have a read on uh, how this plays out for people who haven't already gotten involved. Yeah, uh, those lucky betters who are sitting on uh, Florida State <laughs> minus 13, I mean, Georgia Tech minus, plus 13 and a half, and then Florida State now minus 10. I thought that was smart money uh, to be taking uh, Georgia Tech at the plus 13 and a half, right? Um, a lot of turnover for Florida State okay. here. And then when the market moved, I jumped in quick on Florida State at minus 11 because I knew there would be buyback. I actually was a little incorrect in my assumption that the buyback would start at 11. The buyback didn't start until 12 to give them a three and a half point middle. But I also had this number uh, sitting closer to the 12 and a half as my fair price for Florida State when it came out. So I was still getting a point and a half uh, of value here. And I still like the Seminoles um, even even at the 10 and a half. Obviously, I like it better. But we talk about turnover in college football, and sometimes we talk about it a little too much. We talk about it as if some of these programs aren't replacing with like players or just retooling and reloading. And my biggest um, my biggest factor in saying that is the trenches, offensive and defensive lines of Florida State. Defensive line, we know verse went to the NFL, right? So we just um, assume that Florida State's going to be bad on the defensive line. I think that's just the notion. Oh, Georgia Tech will be able to run on them. No, this is still going to be a stout defensive line for Florida State. And then Georgia Tech, their defensive line, not good against a, a Florida State offensive line that returns a ton of production. Um, I, I think Florida State will be able to run all over Georgia Tech. A little nugget as well that a lot of people don't realize, as good as Haynes King played last season, Mm -hmm. He really struggled under pressure. Um, Florida mm -hmm. State's really good at getting to the quarterback, really getting Haynes King under pressure. If they're running the ball successfully um, with their fourth or three-headed monster, whatever they decide to deploy at running back, I believe this is going to be one where Florida State controls the pace, they get up big, and then you're going to have to rely on Haynes King to kind of bail you out of the game, get you back in. And if he's a turnover-worthy quarterback, turnover passes, then it's going to be scary. I also took Roydell Williams over rushing yards. And I'll be quick with this point. Uh, Roy Williams came out of Alabama, didn't get an opportunity to really let his light shine. He sat behind Jace McClellan and it was Jace McClellan's backfield. Now he sits behind Telefilo, but he's still going to be playing as a one B option. I think he's going to have like a breakout game. This is his chance. It's been a long time since Roy Williams has seen double digit carries. I've seen the books projected his number at 11. I had him projected at 12 carries in this game. So if he gets that against a really bad, the, the one of the worst uh, run defense in the country, I think going over 66 and a half is pretty easy. Okay. Anyone, anything else leap out to you uh, in terms of week zero spreads or totals, Brad? I see that uh, Hawaii are 40 and a half point favorites over <laughs> Delaware State, which is, I believe, the same line as uh, the Brisbane Lions are favored over uh, the Essendon Bombers in the AFL. Um, anything leap out to you as a bet? Um, I, I just want to kind of monitor this monitor, Mon Montana State line against New Mexico. Mm. 11 and a half point favorites. It's the first time the biggest uh, FCS uh, favorite over FBS since Old Dominion in 
2013 versus who they play Idaho and they covered that spread. So I want to see if this happens. I know Montana state, uh, their best running back will be out of the game. Uh, that just announced like a couple hours ago. Um, but this is a pretty good program against the New Mexico state with a lot of turnover. A lot of people who hit the portal and they weren't really good. Um, so I'll monitor that. And if Preston Stone plays for SMU, I'll probably lay the 24 and a half. They have some key players out, which you don't want to go crazy on this game. Um, but Nevada two win program, them, them, they have turnover as well. And uh, the good news for SMU when you're going in these big spread games, they're returning a lot of production on offense, but they're also returning a ton of starters on defense. So they'll be able to keep uh, Nevada kind of at bay while they try to run it up. Is it that that Montana State market was pretty interesting because yeah. it's always it's always a tough thing to kind of come up with lines like that. They opened nine and a half. It's been bet out to 13 and a half. And uh, as you mentioned, news hit the wire and nobody flinched <laughs> yeah. so that Montana State, State, yeah. digits, and then now it's going crazy and everyone's like whoa <laughs> it's all the way up to 13 and a half now oh my goodness yeah so lopsided market there for uh for the uh uh the poor new mexico team uh all that said uh let's move to some of the higher profile stuff that's coming down the stretch there's some big liquidity to, to be had in these uh uh conference championship markets we talked to uh vaughn already about his thoughts in terms of the you know the uh, the, the college football playoff title heisman things like that um but uh, before we get there, we're going to resolve some of these um, Big Ten, in particular Big Ten SEC champions uh, that I'm inclined to bet into. Um, and Big Ten championship, pretty interesting this year. No, Gone are the days where this comes down to one game between Ohio State and Michigan, uh, as you now have a second choice in Oregon, third choice in Penn State, uh, and then you have some outsiders, including USC, uh, Iowa, and Nebraska, on that, Washington on that second tier there. Uh, when you look at the Big Ten overall, do you feel like this is as top heavy as the market thinks, where there are really only four teams that have a chance to win? Uh, or do you think that there could be some uh, fascinating ways to capitalize on uh, volatility in this market? I actually think this is going to be very top heavy. Um, okay. For me, it, it almost comes down to the top two between Ohio State and Oregon. Yeah, sure, Penn State can 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 be better. They can improve. Uh, Drew Alar can be a better thrower of the ball. Um, they brought in they brought in Julian Fleming, which kind of helps that team um, in 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 the receiver core. But it's got to be a two man race, in, in my opinion. Uh, starting with Ohio State, number one, been there, done that, right? Ohio State's been running the Big Ten for quite some time. It's going to be it's flip flopped with them in Michigan as of late. And Ryan Day knows how to win in big games. And we keep, I think the there's this this notion that Ryan Day is a bad coach. We hear this all the time, but. Ryan Day consistently has his team in a position to win, consistently has his team in a chance to make it to the college football playoff, and that is really promising. This team's so stacked, right, where they bring in Will Howard, and Will Howard always had to be the guy at Kansas State. Now he comes into Ohio State, and he doesn't have to be the guy. Two-headed monster at running back. Uh, one, a running back who's probably has the most electric speed. Then they got a pounder in Travion Henderson. It, it, it's so funny to see this is the first year where we're like, what's this wide receiver core going to do for Ohio State? And it's still <laughs> stacked, right? Buka, Tate, the yeah. freshman Smith, uh, Brandon Innes is even good. Um, and then on the defensive line, they're always strong, but the, to get uh, Sawyer and Tolomolu back was really nice. So I think they're going to be solid, right? They bring in um, Caleb Downs as well, who's going to be an All-American. This team is plus 150 for a reason. And then Oregon. An another another team that's super stacked and without going through their entire lineup i just want to highlight three players dylan gabriel they bring in a quarterback yep. uh evan stewart now they have a wide receiver one to pair with tez johnson then they bring in Jab jabbar muhammad um in the secondary their secondary is gonna be totally new and you could tell me that this team is going to beat ohio state in eugene sure i that's fine i that's cool if you want to do that right it's a home game. It's going to be a tough travel for Ohio State. It's about winning the big game at the end of the season, and I don't think I've seen that from Dan Lanning yet in his short time as a head coach. So for me, plus 200 is just a little little short. But, man, bringing in DG is, is absolutely phenomenal for this team. I think DG has a chance to put up better numbers than uh, than Mr. Bo Nix. It's funny if you look at this Oregon offense, um, let's look at some some little nerdy stats like pass success rate and EPA per pass explosive rate, like all really outstanding for Oregon last year, but all numbers that DG, uh, he sets up 
to kind of uh, expand or make them better, it's because of the, the chances that he takes downfield. So those are my two horses, but I just couldn't get down with the price on Oregon. I'd have to get a little bit bigger of a number. Okay. Well, firstly, I will not hear any defense for Ryan Day after in the college football semifinal <laughs> against Georgia a couple of years ago, uh, he played for a 50-yard field goal as time expired with Noah Rogers. Harrison got hurt. Yeah, I don't care. Uh, he cost me the uh, GDP of a small island nation by playing for the field goal <laughs> with Mr. Ruggles, who was uh, not even close. I can still no. see him hooking about three field goals uh, distances left um, <laughs> off, the, off the kick. Um, but uh, I've been advised as well that uh, – Ohio State is the best bet at price that even like plus 150 that we're looking at here on BetMGM that is um, a bit higher to, compared to some other places in the market. So I think that's a decent, uh, I'm told that's a decent bet, perhaps a decent uh, decent parlay leg as well. Any long shots on the board, Brad, that are of interest or is it just not the market for that? No, not in, not in this conference. I don't see any, like, who are you going to take? You're really going to back Will Rogers in, in Washington. You really believe in Riola coming in year one. Do you believe in Miller Moss? Like the pricing, it, it kind of is fair, <laughs> I thought. And I don't think there's anybody who's worth a stab in my eyes. Okay, that's fair. When there's no bet to be made, there's no bet to be made. All right, the Rotoworld Fantasy Football Draft Guide is now available exclusively through a new partnership with Matthew Berry's Fantasy Life. Get a Fantasy Life Plus subscription and receive the Rotoworld Draft Guide plus fantasy, DFS, and betting tools to help you dominate all season long. Use promo code ROTO10 for 10% off. Go to fantasylife.com slash Rotoworld to learn more. All right, the SEC champion market, mm. Brad, Georgia, as is their want, they're plus 180. And the favorite, Texas, plus 350. Wow. We have Mississippi and Alabama and LSU as the next tier before Tennessee and Texas A&M. Who do you like in this market? I call this the expectation versus execution. There's a lot of high expectations for teams like Texas, Ole Miss, um, and we just go back to the well again and again because Georgia knows how to execute. They're going to dominate this conference for a little bit, I believe, before Texas finally gets their footing in here. If you want to be serious and, and compare the two that we just talked about, right? You want to compare the SEC and the Big the Big Ten. I think the SEC championship, it, it gives you more opportunity to kind of spread your money around because I think there's a legitimate chance for the top four to come out and, and win this, this championship. Number one, there's not many holes in Georgia – Right, they're going to have an All American uh, leading that that secondary in uh, Starks. There, they're really good on offense. Probably going to be uh, one of the top quarterbacks taken in the draft in Carson Beck. They bring in Trevor Etienne from Florida, who's another stud. Offensive line's really good, but for me, it's the schedule. Right, mm -hmm. if they slip up enough, you could be in a really good position if you're holding on to like a Texas at uh, plus three fifty or an, or an Ole Miss at plus six fifty because Georgia's schedule is pretty tough. They have to play at Alabama, at Texas, at Ole Miss. So then you think about Texas, whose tough games are Michigan and um, in Georgia, like I just said. But Texas, man, they're gonna have a bunch of dogs on offense, right? Track speed. They probably did the best in terms of replacing offense in the entire country, bringing in um, Silas Bolden. Uh, Matthew Golden, Isaiah Bond, three really good wide receivers to help Quinn Ewers. They also are another team with an experienced quarterback. And then Ole Miss. I think if you want to take some money, you take Ole Miss here. Um, a lot of expectation for Ole Miss, but the winners of the transfer portal, in my opinion, because what they did on the defensive end. If you heard Nick Saban at Nick Saban at the SEC Media Days, he said something that resonated with me. I had to dig in a little deeper. He said the problem with Ole Miss wasn't that their team wasn't good enough to compete with Alabama. It's they weren't physical enough or big enough in the trenches to consistently match up play yeah. after play, which means if they take a lead or it was late and they were trying to come back, Alabama knew that they were physically imposing. Well, what did uh, did Ole Miss do? They went and got two really good edge defenders from Texas and Tennessee, then added Walter Nolan inside the interior. And Ole Miss doesn't have to play Alabama, Texas, or Missouri. So for mm -hmm. me, if Jackson Dart could stay healthy, I think the bet is Ole Miss here just because of the value you're getting. That's interesting. Uh, I was going to try to make a case or kick your brain on um, Missouri. 
Um, but the uh, the real kind of fascinating part of all of the SEC this year is you have almost all of the top 10 offenses in college football in one conference. And uh, gone are the days of, uh, you know, kind of SEC football being dictated by, uh, you know, winning in the trenches and really defensive line and, and, uh, and secondary play, apparently, because, yeah, number two offense of the country right now, LSU, number three, Georgia, number four, Texas. Uh, number seven, Alabama, oh, excuse me, number six, Ole Miss, number seven, Alabama, number eight, Missouri. Um, now, ultimately, if you have the fifth best offense in your conference, you got a little bit of a you know a gap to make up. But at 20 to one, uh, there seems like there are weirder things than that team, you know, that Missouri team kind of finding their way into the mix to where they're, uh, you know, kind of right knocking on the door, maybe in the SEC championship game. Um, does this feel a lot, a little bit more sort of flat earth at the top here because these offenses are so relatively close? Man. Yeah, I guess. Right. Like I feel like Missouri would just have to do a lot. And I, I think I'm, I'm grading Missouri a little bit down by losing Schrader. Like I thought he was such a big piece running Mm -hmm. the ball there, but their wide receiver core is going to be good. Brady cook another year of having him Luther burden, probably a good pick to win the Heisman around 80 to 90 to one. I just don't have a, a bet on them. I don't have enough confidence in them. Their schedule sets up. It's fairly decent, right? Like, and I'm going to say this, do not laugh because it's hard to play in Jordan Hare, but they play Auburn at home and don't have to play in Jordan Hare, one of the toughest places to play in the SEC. They do play at Bryant Denny, which is which is difficult. But I mean, outside of the Alabama game, like where are they really afraid? Oklahoma? Yeah. I don't think so. So if they come out here, man, they win 10, 11 games, they're going to have themselves in the title game. And 20 to one looks a lot better when that happens. <laughs> I've, we agree. Uh, <laughs> I've uh I've been advised to bet on Texas AM at 14 to 1. I think a large part of that is the schedule where they don't have to play Georgia, Ole Miss, or Alabama. So you're dodging three of the top four favorites in the SAC. What do you think of Texas AM, Brett? Ah uh, man, uh with bringing Elko as coach, good coaching. Connor Wegman should be better again. Um lost a little bit in the portal, gained a little bit in the portal. For me, I'm going to pass. And I I think even when I was doing my preseason power rankings, I wanted to put them higher. I wanted to. And I had to drop them down just because I I still can't get over this notion that Texas A&M is is never going to be the program that they want to be. Um, we'll see what happens. They, they have a much better coach. Uh, maybe they'll start dumping some money in the facilities these next couple of years to kind of be that program they want to be. I've heard a lot of positive buzz about Texas A&M's camp and their D-line just absolutely dominating. Um, It's really tough to find a standout defense across this SEC group, which is weird (laughs) because, again, that's how it used to be. Um, And uh, right now, at least relative to, say, like SP+, which I would hold up as sort of the gold standard of public numbers, um, they have Texas A&M as the 24th defense, which I disagree with. So uh, I do think there is certainly margin there to find ways into unders, team total unders against Texas A&M until there's uh, an adjustment to putting that sort of in a top 10 defensive rating range. It's more about the offense where I don't know if you're going to be able to keep up with some of these uh, programs. Uh, honestly, like th- this is just an embarrassment of riches of some of the best offenses in uh, uh, in college football. I guess maybe the one kind of key thing that I would say is we haven't really made a case for Texas. We haven't really made a case for Alabama. Like there's not a ton, in my opinion, that separates the Missouris and A&Ms of the world of the Alabamas and Texas, which is why you know, taking some swings at some bigger prices, you're 14 to one, 20 to one, uh, makes sense to me relative to, you know, Texas being plus 350 feels like, I, honestly, like if I, if I was a bookmaker, you would be very happy finding some Texas alum and just writing those numbers all day long. Cause I feel like yep. that's going to be a really tough uh, needle for them to thread uh, as they are pretty similar, I think, in, in just composition to a lot of these other second tier teams in the SEC. Um, I want to give my, I'll just give my quick thoughts on Texas and why I didn't, wasn't too excited on them to win the the SEC championship. This is a different SEC. It used to be these powerful backs just gas you up. And now it's quarterbacks who are efficient. We have uh, Georgia who's (laughs) top three in the nation in EPA per play and literally didn't pass the ball in the second half in most games because their schedule was so easy. Then you have an Ole Miss team with Jackson Dart, Juice Wells, Trey Harris. That's if Juice Wells is healthy. 
who's going to be passing the ball a ton. Then Alabama, who brings in DeBoer, and we know that DeBoer, in his four seasons as a head coach, has been top 10 in passing yards per game. And the times he wasn't number one or number two was at Fresno State. So we should expect another boost in Alabama. So um, I, I just can't do it with Texas because 59th last year in pass coverage grade. It's not going to get it done. The secondary is not strong enough. Bringing in Trey Moore helps a lot on the uh, defensive line to put a little bit more pressure in the face of the quarterbacks. They don't have as much time, but until that back end gets better, I can't have them. Okay. Uh, let me make a fun market for you. <clears throat> Out of the 12 playoff teams, uh, over under five and a half SEC teams in the mix. Oh, man. <laughs> I think you have to go over. You think because, they're going to get six? Is it all the, come down the, to Alabama? Yeah, the, it'll all come down to Alabama. It, I'm on Alabama to make the playoffs too. Okay, okay. Um, And you're going to have some of those guys who squeak in because they only have like one or two losses because they don't really play anybody. And then you have Alabama who, well, I think they're like 15th in strength of schedule, so they're 15th hardest schedule in the nation. But the composite rankings just came out today, by the way. It was the biggest news. I've been waiting for these to come out. So what that does is it takes – uh, it, it ranks the, all the talent, all the teams, and then ranks all the teams in the country. Alabama came out as number one, right? Wow. Like people hear Caleb Downs leaves. Yes, big, massive loss for the, the Crimson Tide there. Dude's going to be a stud, All-American. He's going to be a top five draft pick. But a lot of the other players weren't really playing, right? Benson, wide receiver, wasn't playing yet. Bond, pivotal. Where they're going to miss him, but then you have the cornerbacks who who weren't starters, weren't getting a ton of playing time. Alabama uh, brought in some good talent, and they have really good running backs, uh, a, a great offensive line. I have Alabama uh, losing two games, and they can borderline. Uh, I'll just be a one loss team this year. It's mm -hmm. all up to how that offense hums. Um, and let me just give you. I'll be quick on this, but when I was watching Alabama uh, at the spring practices. There were some things about the offense that made me want to drool. So we think about DeBoer, his number one kind of uh, feature that he used in his offense, he uses screen passes a lot. Uh, and, and But he does it based off a lot of eye candy, a lot of motions. Alabama, in their practices, were running jet motions built into different things. So basically what they were doing, they were sending wide receivers across, sending tight ends across, and they are building them into screen passes, tight end screens, wide receiver screens, and then uh, and then building them into like ISO power. And what that basically means, they're just running the ball off a jet motion with a fake tight end screen. I said a lot of words because that's what's supposed to happen, right? It's supposed to be a lot of this beautiful eye candy window dressing that confuses the defense. Alabama hasn't had that in a long time. What that leads to in offenses, especially with a quarterback, they're not the best. Let's, let's say, I'm not judging Jalen Milrow, but let's say he doesn't take the next step forward. It just designs guys open. It makes offense easy instead of having to force balls in and making too many reads. That's what that window dressing does. It's exciting to see as an Alabama guy because I'm, I want to see fun games where we're back to scoring 40 points a game. Brad, I'm told that you like uh, Jalen Milrow at 14 to 1 to win the Heisman, which, uh, to be fair, is a very good price relative to market. The downside is I watched a lot of Jalen Milrow play football last season. Uh, he does have a wild streak in him. Uh, it was a as someone who was heavily invested in Alabama winning the SEC uh, and then winning it all. Uh, it was, now to be fair, like the Michigan loss, that wasn't on him at all. That wasn't his fault. Um, and he played fairly well in the SEC title game before trying to fumble the ball away um, at the end. But what do you think of Milrow's upside? I mean, statistically, last year looked very impressive. He finished sixth in the Heisman. Do you think that he can take a leap and kind of channel some of that wild energy into uh, perhaps some more sane decisions? Yes, I absolutely do think he can channel some of that energy. But um, one thing that's not being talked about a lot this uh, offseason is Milrow actually shortened his passing motion, uh, mm -hmm. not as long as extended, not as predictable, will give more control, more accuracy. But there's a couple things that I look for when I'm targeting the Heisman market. Number one, I need a big brand name, not only the brand name of the school, but a brand name player. Very rarely do you see a player who has no recognition or no storylines come out of nowhere to win the Heisman. Then Number two, I need a team that has a defense that's not elite. They may be good enough, but not elite because you do not want your players sitting on the sidelines when the second half comes. You want them racking up. You want potential chances for shootouts. Next, you need an elite 
wide receiver core if you're backing a quarterback or elite game breaking uh, playmaking abilities. And Jalen Milrow has that with his leg. Then last but not least, I add in the piece where he's getting in a new coach and Kalen DeBoer, who's led the passing attack, led yards per play in top four in two years. And then when he was at Fresno State, was in the top 10 in yards per air pass, air attempt. Those are massive. All of those put together at 14 to one. I thought he, I literally looked at the board and I go, there's no way I'm going to be on Jalen Milrow. And I'll say this, Jay, I don't bet on a lot of Heisman picks all at once, right? Before the season starts, but I've been pretty successful in these last five years. Um, I, I had uh, Devonta Smith, which I was kind of lucky because I, I also had Jalen Waddle there. So I knew one of them was going to be the explosion had Caleb Williams, Bryce young, then Michael Penix jr. For the exact same reasons I just laid out. And I still would have given it to Michael Penix Jr. because his team didn't lose three games. And more importantly, your team cannot lose three or more games. Yeah, I think that is the interesting thing with Heisman is that either you need a massive success on a team level um, and obviously to be coupled with huge individual stats. But we have seen in the past that you know there is an avenue for the Jaden Daniels of the world, even if you're not a playoff team, to be able to just put up insane video game type of numbers uh, and win in that fashion. And I guess the way that you know Bo Nix kind of, well, he didn't melt so much, but just the team losing at yeah. the end probably you know cost him, and he was otherwise the cleanest candidate. And then that just kind of made it a walk in um, for Daniels in the end. All right, before we get to some college football win totals, fantasy football season just got better, $1 million better. Create or join a private Yahoo Fantasy League and enter the $1 million NBC sweepstakes, plus earn extra entries to win when players on your fantasy roster score a touchdown during an opening weekend game on NBC or Peacock. Download the redesigned Yahoo Fantasy app or go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Million to learn more. As you all know by now, we've teamed up with BetMGM this season. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all our picks, and we'll have special offers for our listeners each week. If you haven't signed up to BetMGM yet, use bonus code BETEDGE, and you'll get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's how it works. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using bonus code BETEDGE. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game and you'll receive up to $1,500 in bonus bets if your first bet loses. Just make sure you use bonus code BETEDGE when you sign up. See BetMGM.com for terms, 21 plus only. U.S. promotional offers not available in New York, Nevada, Ontario, or Puerto Rico. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER, available in the U.S. Call 8778-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369 in New York. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP in Arizona, 1-800-327-5050 in Massachusetts, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-981-0023 in Puerto Rico. First bet offer for new customers only, subject to eligibility requirements. Rewards are non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days in partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, use bonus code BETEDGE and get your $1,500 first bet offer today. Okay, let's close out with some win totals. Brad, the highest win totals among the Power Five, Ohio State, 10.5, heavily back to the over. Georgia, 10.5, as well as our Oregon and Notre Dame, and then 10 flat, Texas and Utah. Uh, what is your favorite win total bet? My favorite win total bet, it does not come from this market just because these I have the liquidity has been sucked out of them, right? Like laying a minus one forty five, <laughs> minus one seventy five on Ohio State's a little difficult. I actually went with uh, with Miami mm -hmm. over nine and a half wins. Uh, Miami does start the season that's pretty difficult at Florida. It's always tough to play in the swamp, but as we've seen, that number has gone from one two. I think it was two on Tuesday, um, and now it's creeping up to that three number, <laughs> and the win totals coming down. Miami faces one of these situations where if it's not now win, right? They went out in the transfer portal. They brought Cam Ward. They bring in Damian Martinez. Offensive lines can be one of the best in the country. The defensive line's good. Secondary is good. It's all coaching all up to crystal ball, but their schedule sets up fairly nice. And I, when I was projecting their win total, it was nice because I didn't care about the first game in terms of making money. 
yes, winning against Florida kind of sets up their season nice, but it also gives you another opportunity to buy Miami again a second time should they lose. I was projecting that price would be eight and a half for like maybe minus 140. Yes, it's juice, but they still have an opportunity to still win both of those bets should they lose in the swamp. And just because they lose in the swamp in week one of the season doesn't mean that they're a bad team or they failed. It's literally the swamp in week one of the season. Yeah, I, I, I know a lot of the people who are behind that move and their handicap was super complicated. Miami's better than Florida at every positional group, so they're going to yep. win this game. Uh, and <laughs> kind of, uh, yeah, it's on the road. And yeah, I think Florida, we didn't mention them at all in the SEC, and I think rightfully so. They are in deep, deep trouble in that conference. So uh, yeah, if they get off, if they get off to a losing start here, uh, I think uh, it could be a long, uh, long season for that coaching staff. Um, but uh, do you think there's upside with uh, Miami to win the ACC? I know we didn't talk about that market, but uh, I was kind of surprised Bill Conley only had them at 13 uh, percent chance to win. I've heard plenty of bull cases that Miami could uh, ultimately steal one of the playoff spots if they win the ACC are you that bullish on them in terms of win total yeah so I waited I was waiting as long as I possibly could because (laughs) one of my trader friends literally put out his predictions for that conference last night and I was Mm -hmm. like am I just crazy for not just gobbling up Miami and he was like I can't not can't not take this number and it's right like there's a lot of question marks about Florida State right we talk we're gonna bet on Florida State but long-term success, a lot has to go right to kind of make all of these pieces move together. And as excited as I am about Florida State, I have to be a little realistic that bringing in outcasts doesn't always work. And the best example is Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin often brings in guys who, in the transport have these big names and are really highly like sought after by the entire country and then doesn't play them right because they just don't fit a system or maybe they they have like uh some problems in the locker room they don't practice hard so you have you're dodging a lot of bullets when you're rebuilding teams um then you look at like a uh, clemson who it's adapt or die for clemson they don't want to <laughs> adapt they don't want to go to the portal um they don't like nil it's just too hard i'm not high on club nick they'll have a good defensive line so for me I just think there's so much value on on Miami, even at I think it's plus down to plus four hundred now, maybe some plus four fifties out there. Yeah. I think Miami wins the ten games this season, wins the ACC, and and makes it to the playoffs. I did my bracket, um, and I thought it was gross that I had Miami in the four seed. <laughs> All right, Miami plus four hundred to win the ACC. Uh, any other win totals you like, Brad? Or before we get out of here, any other bets that you just want to throw out into the world? Yeah, let me be a little gross with this one, guys, because um, if you <laughs> not you guys, obviously, but the people who are listening, if you want to make money, you kind of have to stop just only targeting the big names, the names that everyone knows, because there's no liquidity in that market. Those are the tightest markets. I'm going North Texas over five and a half wins this season. Love their wow. schedule, right? They won. They had a tough schedule last year because not how, how they played, but in 12 matches, they were one score games. Well, that's crazy, right? They went five and seven. Well, five of those losses were in one score games. I said that incorrectly. Five of the losses were in one score games. They were they can score, right? They could score a ton of points. Is it a downgrade bringing in Chandler Morris TCU? I don't think so. I think Chandler Morris is going to be one of those situations that we see often where you have a, a quarterback coming from a big school, goes to the smaller school, puts up really big numbers. Um, my problem with them and why they weren't a better team last year was defensively. Defensively, they were so bad. They had to literally outscore opponents. They were 4-0 when scoring 40 or more points. They returned 66% of the defensive production. You have to get better, right? Bad defenses have to get better when players return. At least we hope so. Their schedule sets up favorably. So I took them over five and a half wins. I was really excited about that. Okay. North Fun. Texas, the mean green, apparently, which I'm learning. We bet for, them a uh, lot on our show. <laughs> okay. There you go. North Texas. I can't I can't claim to know a great deal about North Texas football, uh, but I will trust you on that one, Brad. All right. Well, everyone can follow Brad at Mr. Brad Thomas on Twitter slash X. Uh, what are you working on at the moment, Brad? Uh, right now, we're getting ready to start the power rankings for the Premier League. They come out. I'm really excited for the first one, and I absolutely have no idea what to do yet, but that's why we study, and that's why we research. So make sure you check it out on X and on NBCSports.com. 
Okay, very good. All right, well, we are done for today. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to rate and subscribe. Also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. I'm Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick. Thanks again to Brad Thomas, and we'll see you soon.